Welcome to Hope Natural Health, the podcast inspiring you to be your best version. Join me, your host, Dr. Erin, naturopathic doctor, dog mom, cancer survivor, and girl boss weekly as we discuss all things health, hormones, and happiness with a little side of this thing called life. Welcome back to the Hope Natural Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Erin Ellis, your host and licensed naturopathic doctor located in sunny Arizona. I'm a dog mom, cancer survivor, and girl boss whose passion in life is to help you become your best version. This podcast is all things health, happiness, and this thing called life. Last week, we discussed surprising foods that might hurt your digestion. So if you're experiencing some digestive discomfort, take a listen to that episode. Now let's dive into this week's episode. Today, I'm joined with Kim Sorrell, who is an entrepreneur, director of humanitarian organization, author, and speaker. She devoted a year in search of the true meaning of love, and she found it. Her award-winning best-selling book, Love Is, chronicles her sometimes funny, sometimes scary, always enlightening journey that led to life-changing discoveries found mainly on the streets of Haiti. Kim is now on a mission to change the world with the power of love. So today we're going to talk about all things love. So welcome to the show, Kim. Thank you so much, Erin. I am so thrilled to be here. Yay, I'm looking forward to this conversation. We all need a little bit more love in our life, so this is going to be wonderful. But first, let's talk about your background and how you really got into doing what you're doing, because you really have quite the story from what I saw online. Yes, well, uh, things changed for me dramatically a few years ago, just like you went through a similar experience where mm -hmm. you get a cancer diagnosis and uh, it really makes you think about everything and yeah. everything kind of changes. And so I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, I was 47 years old, never thought I'd have breast cancer, kind of fought getting a mammogram, but I went and did it and it was a good idea. Right. But uh, yeah. So, but then four months later, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he died six weeks mm. after that. And it was a weird time, a tough time. Uh, you don't expect more than one cancer diagnosis to hit like that, you know, just four months apart. And then to lose mm. him, the love of my life, it was um, just a, a difficult time. And it made me question some things. I wanted to know that I was going to be doing life right going forward. Yeah. I had a great marriage. And I just really wanted to honor my husband in knowing that I'm living it right. And so I questioned the true meaning of love because, you know, whatever, John Legend sings about it and Nicholas Sparks writes about it, but there seems to be this mystery surrounding what is love really. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to take a year to figure it out. And how did it all start uh, with, because you said you found the discoveries mainly on the streets of Haiti. So how right. did Haiti come into play with this? Well, when I was finally able to go back to work after I was through all my mm -hmm. health stuff, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to go back into my businesses, but I had people running them. Mm -hmm. or if I was going to go back to, to the nonprofit world or what I was going to do. And I ran into a man in between Christmas and New Year's who was running an organization that my father and I had started 10 years before that. And I said, hey, do you need any help? You know, kind of thinking maybe I'll take things slow and figure out life. And uh, I said, what about bookkeeping? And he said, oh, my gosh, yeah, if you want to do the bookkeeping, that'd be great. So January 1st of that year, I started out as part-time bookkeeper. And 12 days later, there was an earthquake in Haiti that killed 200,000 people. So my job went from part-time to 24-7. And within a couple of weeks, I was in Haiti. And then I spent part of every month in Haiti for the next mm. several years. Oh, wow. So how did you really discover love there? It's kind of how. Yeah. Well, I used, you know, I went there to work, of yeah. course. You know, that's how I started out. So I, I didn't start this year-long thing right away. But uh, when I figured out what I was going to do and how I was going to start it, I used this 2,000-year-old 
poem that you hear at all these weddings and your eyes kind of glaze over because you hear it so much. Love is patient, love is kind, does not mm. envy, does not boast, et cetera. And I decided I was going to take one word a month and figure out, well, what is love that is patient? What is love mm. that is kind? And the first thing I figured out, Aaron, is that there are 14 is and isn'ts of love. And so a year wasn't mm. going to cut it. Mm. It took me a little bit longer than a year. But I just looked for it. I First month out, I mean, I just, it was just constantly on my mind. I just looked for it. And it took to an entire month. Like, you'd think it'd be so easy, right? Patience, we know what patience is, right? So love that is patient, that'll be easy. Every single month, it took me an entire month to really figure out what, what the thing was that I was working on that month. So how did you figure it out? Well, so like, you know, the very first one, love is patient. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I went in thinking, well, I, you know, you don't honk your horn in traffic, you know, so that's how, you know, patience is, or you call your dog, he doesn't come and you give him an extra second, you know, that's showing patience. But I had this ridiculous experience with dealing with uh, customs and the docks in Haiti. We had sent down uh, all kinds of relief items and in big containers, big mm -hmm. sea containers, like the back of semi trucks. And it was difficult to get them out. And then it, it just it was one disaster after the other with this particular container because we sent a lot of them down, but this particular one, uh, we had the wrong packing list. We had mm. the wrong list of recipients. We just everything that could go wrong went wrong. And uh, with this particular container. And that's when I figured out what love that is patient is. Mm. And, and what it is, is, you know, I really believe you're supposed to love everybody. Just love everybody. It's just a very healthy, good way to live is mm -hmm. just love everybody. And love that is patient. If you're loving somebody with love that is patient, you recognize that this is the most important mo moment of your life, that the past is in the past and the future is yet to come. This is the moment that will come and go with or without you. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was doing that. I thought I was engaged. I thought I was fully present in front of somebody. But I also thought, I was the greatest multitasker in the history of the world. Like I could think about who had to get to soccer practice, a meeting I had later that night, what I needed to stop mm -hmm. and get at the grocery store, something that happened yesterday, and be fully engaged at the same time. And I learned quickly that I am not that superwoman, and I don't have that power. Mm -hmm. And when I practiced this, because I promise you, this took me so much practice because I stunk at it. <laughs> but when I practiced this and was fully engaged and fully present, I heard things I never would have heard because I really mm. listened instead of having my rebuttal ready or instead of assuming what somebody was gonna say based on some label I put on them, mm. I actually heard the words and it changes everything. If you think about how great it feels when you know that somebody really is giving you every bit that they've got, you mm -hmm. know, is really there fully present with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's love. That's love that is patient. Awesome. So you probably might have answered this, and I'm sure you get asked this all the time. So when people ask you, like, what is love? How do you answer that? Yeah, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. It's a big question. And there, there's real simple answer to it, actually. And then there's things that are more complicated. But love is not. Uh, there are some things that love is not that we've been taught and love is not. But love is not an emotion or a feeling. You know, like if, if we watch a scary movie and we go to bed that night, oh my word, you hear every creak, every mm -hmm. bump, every everything, right? And you're nervous, you get scared. But you don't live in fear. Fear is an emotion. You don't live in that. But love is something that you live in. It It is always there. You don't hang it up in the closet when you get home or when mm -hmm. you go to work. You live it. It's walking, talking, living, breathing. It's who you are. Love is who you are. So it's it's all encompassing that way that it is 
Uh, it's the essence of who you are. And mm -hmm. then how you choose to live it is up to you. Mm. That's great. So how can love motivate every daily action that we do? Well, first of all, you got to know what it is. But then it should. It should. It, like, for me, it's changed everything for me, knowing, knowing the truth about love. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you know, you hear that love's a two-way street, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there are some things that we hear that we're taught because you learn about love from your parents, your grandparents, it, it's passed on, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the definition of love is, and you kind of go along with whatever's going on. But, uh, and you hear that love is a two-way street. And, and if you believe that love is a two-way street, it messes with your mind. Like, because that's messed up because it's not, because mm -hmm. it's not. Love is a one way street. Love is on you, period. You know, if I give you money and you give me a pair of jeans, that's a transaction. If I give you love to get love, that's a transaction. And love is not a transaction. Mm -hmm. Love gives, period. We have no control over anybody but ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So no control. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking that if we give love, somehow we're controlling the amount of love that comes back to us, man, you're just setting yourself up for disappointment and for heartache and for loneliness and, and whatever. So love is 100% on you. So when you really embrace that and realize love is who you are and it's all up to you, your motivations are completely different. Mm -hmm. So you know, you're doing kind things. Love is kind. You're doing kind things because that's what love does, mm -hmm. not to get something back. You yeah. know, you love with no expectations of getting anything in return. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's this whole mind shift, right? Because we live these lives that are relational and we think we need to get something out of every relationship. And, and we do, you know, yeah. we need to be loved. We all want to be loved and love is special in that it comes back to you, but mm -hmm. maybe not the way you plan and maybe not from who you plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, having that mind shift and realizing that love is completely up to you with no expectation of anything in return, then you open yourself up to loving everybody and, and being so much more open with your love and freely giving your love. You got more than a pot of love. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, you only have one pot and when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> you have as much love as you want to have. I love that. How do you help or I guess motivate those that have literally had their heart broken and are afraid to love because they did love and then, it wasn't reciprocated. So how do you approach that situation? That is a great question because I think most of us have been through that, right? Mm -hmm. Where you get your heart broken somewhere along the line. And something that happens when you get your heart broken is you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you turn it inward and yep. you're like, well, what's wrong with me? That yeah. she didn't like me. She didn't like me. You know, what, what did I do wrong? What did I, what could I have done differently? Mm hmm but the reality is you are who you are and mm -hmm. we, we are all unique. Like sometimes I think about like the Mona Lisa, if it ever went up for sale, I don't even know how many millions and millions of mm -hmm. dollars the Mona Lisa would get. Right. It's because it's a one of a kind masterpiece. And so are you, mm -hmm. there is nobody who has ever been exactly like you. Nobody who ever will be exactly like you. You are a one of a kind masterpiece. So embrace that and love yourself, love yourself. So I think part of the heartache is we doubt whether we mm -hmm. really love ourselves. If we're worthy, we doubt whether mm -hmm. we're worthy of love. And the answer is yes, you are worthy of love. Everyone is worthy of love. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're special. And, and, you know, that guy that broke your heart, he was a jerk. Like, yeah. uh, let him go, you know, like, move on. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there are times when, um, you don't like people, you, you can always love people, but you might not like them. And, and there's a difference. And right. so you don't have to like them. So, yeah. it, you know, I, I think when you get your heart broken, go back first to, okay, I am 
unique and special mm-hmm. and wonderful. And I do love myself. And so looking at the relationship, maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe that's, it's not having to look and exactly. think that think bad of yourself, but uh, still love yourself, love yourself through it. Yeah. It goes back to what you said, start inward. Right. Right. And that's, right. and that can go for most everything in life, not just outward love, you know, love yourself, trust yourself. You know, we all struggle right. with that. I think throughout my journey, like I did a lot of therapy on that, you know, cause I was, why is this happening to me? You know, blah, 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 all the, th- you know, why me, why me? And then, you know, look what happened, but it took a lot of work. So, and I had to look inward too. And like you said, we've all been through that breakup and we all blame ourselves and it's, it's not me, it's them. You know, that was their right. decision. I didn't do anything wrong. So right. yeah, very right. good advice. And, you know, yeah. And, and you learn from every relationship, mm-hmm. right? You mm-hmm. know, like I learned from that sociopath that I dated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I learned how to pick out a sociopath and maybe not date one again, you know, whatever, yeah. so hopefully. But so you learn from every relationship. And so it's uh, even even when they end badly, sometimes that's okay. Because mm-hmm. learn what you need to learn, but don't put it on yourself. Yeah. You know, don't think you're so responsible for, for all of it. If, if there's things that you need to get out of it so that you know going into the next relationship, great. Mm-hmm. But don't stop loving yourself because of it. Don't absolutely blame yourself so deeply, right? That right. you question whether you're worthy. Of yeah, that. we are worthy. Yes. How, so... If this is resonating, which I'm sure it will with a lot of the audience, like how can someone start to discover the true meaning of love? Well, I I mean, I, I feel like I did everybody's homework for them. I don't think you have to go to Haiti for a year. And do I was going to say, just read your book. <laughs> yeah, that, that happened to me. You know, I was chased by a motorcycle gang. I oh, my gosh. And snakes. I mean, it was crazy, crazy time. And. Uh, and so you don't have to do that. So I think, you know, it's, it's some self-discovery, but really realizing or, or even just, um, uh, coming to grips with maybe there's a different definition for love than the Mm. one, you know, Mm -hmm. than the one that that you've lived with your whole life and be open to that, be Mm -hmm. open to see if there's a different definition. Mm-hmm. And then, and then kind of go from there. It's taken me a lot of work. I, I was a work and <laughs> I was a, I was like a lump of clay trying to figure this whole thing out and uh, not very attractive one. Like when I was working on this, lo- I did not understand love. There were so many things that I learned about love that I never knew that I just never knew, never mm-hmm. was demonstrated to me, never taught. And so uh, as I finished one month, I would be working on that same principle of love the next month while I was working on the next month. And so it was, you know, yeah. it was quite a journey. But I think, you know, the first thing is to be open to is there, uh, do you really know everything about love? Is there something more to know about love? Yeah. And uh, when you when you know that there is, then then you can figure it out. That's awesome. You, I'm going to touch back on what you said in the beginning with the, the love is kind, love is, what are, can you go through, do you remember them off the top of your head? All uh, of them? Sure. I, I hope so. Okay. Um, if you forget love, one or two, it's fine. How many are there? 14? 14. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. Is not proud. Love is not self-seeking. It does not dishonor others. Uh, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love always protects, always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres. And love never fails. And I missed one because I think that was only 13. Uh, love does not easily anger. That's the one I missed. Wow. So you spent one month diving into each one of those. Can yes. you give us another example of how you found another one of them? So oh you did the gosh. patient. Well, yeah. 
for sure. That, so the one that I dreaded, mm. you know, like I tried to do them in order, pretty mm-hmm. much I did them in order. But when this one came up, I was like, oh, I don't know. And it's love keeps no record of wrongs. Mm-hmm. Because I'm thinking, well, you might forgive people, but you don't forget the yeah. things that happened to you, right? Yep. So that month, I happened to be, uh, I had a gentleman from the U.S. call and ask if I would show him this water project that I was working on. And I'm like, sure, you know, great. They wanted to see if they wanted to get involved in it. So eight men came over from the U.S. And then two of my Haitian friends also happened to be men, came along with us to translate. And they'd been working on the water project. So they knew it inside and out. And so we drive out into the countryside and we get to where we're staying. And it's this little building with two rooms. And each room has four twin size beds in it. So eight American men, two Haitian men and me. But we brought two cots and we brought an air mattress, a little extra room in the rooms. You know, we'll get by. I wasn't worried about it. Well, the man, the head guy pulls me over. Kim, Kim, can I talk to you? I'm like, sure. And he said, did you see the rooms? And I'm thinking, buddy, there's nothing else to see. This is a little place. And then I went, oh, he's asking me because he's going to think that I want my own room. Mm. So I'll say, well, it's okay. I'll sleep outside. And he'll say, oh, no, no. If anybody should sleep inside, it should be you. And I'll say, well, I don't mind if there's other people in the room. And he'll go, good, because there's only so much space. So I said, well, it's okay. I'll sleep outside. And he said, oh, good, good. Because we've got men on this trip that would not be happy with a woman in their room. And I'm thinking, what is going to happen? I, like, I wear pajamas to bed. I mean, what is going to happen in the middle of the night in hot, hot Haiti with other people in the room? I had no idea what they, what this man was thinking, but I said I'd sleep outside, so I had to figure it out. So I saw this piece of plywood kind of held up by a couple of wooden structures and I thought, well, if I put the air mattress under there, at least I won't get wet if it rains. But I was scared to death Hmm. because there are tarantulas and there are snakes and there are chupacabras or whatever it is that's lurking in the bushes of 80. And I was so afraid that I would get bitten, poisoned, you know, dismembered. I don't know, something would happen. So the first night I went to bed and the air mattress held air for about an hour. And then I'm laying on gravel. And it was so loud because horns were honking, dogs Mm. were barking. And finally that died down sometime after midnight. And then voodoo drums started in the distance. And that went for a couple hours. So finally then I was able to doze off and go to sleep. First night came and went. Everything was fine. Second night, I'm still scared. And so I go to bed and the same thing. The dogs, the horns, no air in the air mattress. The voodoo drums, finally I'm asleep. But I woke up because there was something on my leg. Oh, jeez. And I thought, oh, my gosh, does Haiti even have the anti-venom to whatever <laughs> it is that is about to bite me? Are they going to be able to airlift me to Miami in time to <laughs> save my leg? You know, like I didn't know what it could possibly be. So I, I slowly lifted my head and I slowly opened my eyes. And it was a chicken. It was a dang chicken on my leg. And I didn't know whether to be happy because it wasn't something worse or mad because it woke me up from this little bit of sleep that I was getting. (laughs) Well, third night came and went, no problem. Fourth night, same thing, dogs, horns, nowhere, voodoo drums, finally asleep. But again, I woke up because it was something on my leg. And again, I was scared to death. And again, I slowly lifted my head and I slowly opened my eyes and it was that dang chicken. <laughs> and I didn't know whether to be happy or mad. But that night we had chicken for dinner. So the fifth night came and went without incident. All was well. And I got to say, at first I was mad. I was bitter. I was like, who mm-hmm. do these guys think they are? You know, like I'm all about equality, but this wasn't equality. This was Kim, you're a woman, you're subhuman. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I felt like they, you know, it wasn't, it just was not a good feeling. And, uh, and then I thought, well, you know, bitterness only hurts me, you know, so I don't want to be bitter. Mm-hmm. Then I went, oh, I've been working on love that keeps no record of wrongs. And it finally dawned mm. on that, 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 uh, yeah, we don't forget the things that happen to us. We don't forget, of course not. But 
the narrative changes, Mm -hmm. the tone of the story changes. We get to pick the tone. We get Mm -hmm. to pick the narrative. So instead of, oh my gosh, these rotten guys that did this rotten thing to me, now it's just kind of this funny story, this thing that happened to me. And I could now literally sleep anywhere in the world Mm -hmm. and be perfectly comfortable. And so that's what love that doesn't keep record of wrongs is. It changes, changes the narrative. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good story. I bet you look at chickens different too. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mind having the chicken for dinner that night and know that I was going to get some sleep, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's funny. Well, it could be where everything could be worse, right? Right. That's another Absolutely. good lesson. Yeah, could have been the tarantula. Sure. Oh, Kim, this has been fun. I'm sure we could talk about love all day, but we'll wrap things up by me asking you a question I ask all my podcast guests. So what would be your best or favorite health tip that you can share with the audience? Well, it is stress gets to you, right? Mm -hmm. And we get stressed when, uh, when we have expectations that aren't met Mm -hmm. and we have expectations that aren't met because we're not loving the right way. Mm. So if you really learn how to love and just give yourself a break and, and love, then uh, it does change your health. It will make you healthier. It'll help take the stress away and that alone. But it does so much more. But that alone helps your health. I love it. Totally. And we got to love ourselves. If you don't love yourselves, you can't be healthy. I, I know that. So Kim has her book, Love Is, which is available on Amazon. So we'll put the link in the show notes. I'm sure it's wonderful. I think I might be putting that in my cart or on Audible. And is there anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap this up? Well, you know, the book is is not a unicorns and rainbows kind mm-hmm. of a love book. Yeah. It is the stories. It is the things that brought me to the, the truths that I know about love and uh, so, uh, you know, it's hopefully a fun read and yeah. educational at the same time. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the love is what the world needs now. Oh, yeah. And and love changes your life. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Oh, it's been so wonderful having you here. A little bit different topic than what I normally, you know, chat about. But like you said, the world needs some love. So that's why I wanted you on the show. So thank you so much for being here, Kim. Thank you so much for having me. You're fabulous. And I love your podcast. It should be on the top of everybody's list. It's so good. Oh, well, thank you. Thank thank you. you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And we'll see you again next week. Mm